So I apologize for, um, once again, it's becoming a refrain uh, uh, for the delay in getting these final video lectures up. Um, I'm going to try in this lecture series to cover three approaches to literary study. Um, they are the three that we covered during the last two class sessions, class sessions in which we also turned from Mrs. Dalloway to Nella Larson's novel, 1929 novel, Passing. Um, I, we had originally, we were originally scheduled to spend four weeks on passing, but due to uh, class cancellations and my own illness back in March, uh, we were only able to spend two weeks on it. Um, and I know many of you, since we're done, we had our last class last week, um, since many of you are probably working on your final portfolios, I'm not sure how many of you will find these video lectures useful, but for those who are curious about um, race studies, new historicism, and Marxist literary criticism, I thought, um, just on the off chance that uh, you would like to uh, either review or learn uh, a bit more about these approaches, uh, I would <laughs> complete, complete this uh, series for you. Okay. And for those uh, who are not in my class, who have never, nevertheless been watching these videos um, and uh, would like to, me to see this through to the end, okay. as imperfect and partial as these videos have been. So with that said, I'm going to launch into some written remarks on Nella Larson's passing and race criticism. Um, I, I wrote this up rather quickly, um, partly, you know, craziness at the end of the semester means that I... Uh, maybe didn't polish this up as, as nicely as some past lectures. Um, but maybe, maybe it'll do us some good anyway. Okay. All right. Over two weeks ago now, we discussed Nella Larson's 1929 novel, Passing for the First Time, in the context of two literary approaches, two, liter uh, two literary approaches, two approaches to literary study, race criticism or critical race studies or critical race theory, and new historicism. It may seem strange to pair these two approaches up, but our accompanying work of literary criticism, Miriam Thaggart's Racial Etiquette, Nella Larson's Passing in the Rhinelander Case, is a fine example of research that bridges many of the approaches that are typically kept apart in a course like this one. So Miriam Thaggart, Thaggart's article is actually the last one in the Norton Critical Edition of Passing. Parker, the author of our textbook, includes his coverage of race studies in a chapter that also gives an overview of post-colonial studies or, and post-colonial theory. Um, this latter approach to literary study uh, is one that we don't, uh, sadly, sadly one that we did not have time to cover this semester. Um, and while it may seem convenient and uh, typically American uh, or Eurocentric to lump these two approaches together, those being race studies and post-colonial studies, the study of race, as many theorists and critics from W.E.B. E. Du Bois to C.L.R. James to the late Stuart Hall to Henry Louis Gates Jr. to Bell Hooks to Patricia Collins to Roderick Ferguson, um, the study of race, according to these theorists, not only butts up against other identity categories, such as sexuality, gender, sex, age, generation, and class, but also up against the problems of transnationalism, globalism, border crossing, diaspora, colonialism and colonialist resistance, slavery and slave trade, broken homes, dispersed peoples, and the formation of new traditions, practices, politics, arts, histories, and literatures. Seen in this light, it makes a kind of sense to pair these approaches together then, as Parker does, um, but I'm afraid that we'll, uh, we paid, we'll be paying less attention to this dimension of the study of race. Um, or one possible dimension of the study of race. Um, but I would love, of course, to stay in dialogue with anybody in class or out of class um, uh, who's interested in the global implications of race studies, um, the history of colonialism, the diverse conditions and challenges of post-colonialism, and, and, of course, the study of literature. Um, but I should, just as a little bit of a warning, um, point out that this is not my field of expertise, um, and I would be happy to point you toward faculty members or instructors in the Department of English um, for whom uh, for whom world literatures uh, and particularly post-colonial literatures and post-colonial theory is a, spe a specialization. 
So where do we begin? Right. As in the case of feminism and queer studies, there is not really a father of race studies. Or, since our example uh, is a novel of the Harlem Renaissance, um, to African or African American studies, right? There's no real father of, of these fields. Nevertheless, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was born shortly after the American Civil War in 1868, then died at the age of 95, a year before the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and his terminal, seminal term, double consciousness, is perhaps as good a starting point as any. In our textbook, Parker cites a significant passage, in fact, a famous passage, from Du Bois's 1903 work, The Souls of Black Folk. Quote, and I'm quoting Du Bois here, quoting Parker, quoting Du Bois. Quote, The Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. End quote. What do we see here? What might we note? Just as feminism places the terms masculine and feminism under scrutiny, and just as queer studies places heteronormative terms like the family or sexual identity under scrutiny, so race studies places race so essentialized and naturalized in what Lacan would call our symbolic order in the West, under question. After all, what Du Bois develops in the passage I just read is not an account of the natural state of black men and women, or the essential disposition of African or black Americans. We have here an account of their historical, material, contingent position and perspective in the United States, which are dependent upon a larger um, excuse me, which is dependent, or are dependent, upon a larger and longer and vaster history, one that the West has tried hard to forget or erase. Though it has, nevertheless, despite these efforts, left its indelible mark not only on the America of the early 20th century, um, uh, which we, in some sense, see in Nella Larson's passing, but also on that of the early 21st as well. Uh, from which we read it and in which we read it. In other words, the yielding of a true self-consciousness to which Du Bois refers is not necessarily a natural stage of human evolution, as so many philosophers of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries believed, but a historical and cultural process. And the history and culture in which black Americans live and die are such that whiteness, as the novel shows us, is the assumed standard, and white privilege the name of the, quote, world that looks on in amused contempt and pity, end quote. This world, which is vast, visible and invisible, taken for granted, and widely represented in media and other cultural productions, is analogous to the positions that patriarchy and reproductive heteronormativity occupy, respectively, in the fields of feminism, fe feminism and queer studies. Uh, though I should note that there are racial uh, or race critiques, I should say, of feminism, of some branches of feminism and queer studies. Um, um, you know, for instance, I think of the black feminism of Bell Hooks and Patricia Collins, um, the queer of color critique of Roderick Ferguson, um, the work of Kathy Cohen. Um, uh, but I often read these critiques as less about um, opposing race studies to feminism or queer studies and more about trying to find... Um, one might think of as lines of affinity or areas of, of shared concern um, between them. Returning to Du Bois's notion of double consciousness, how does passing aid Larson's readers, i.e. us, 
in understanding or demonstrating this concept, this perpetual sense of tuness. We do not need to lurk much further than the title of the novel, which refers, after all, to a phenomenon um, uh, people of one race um, passing or trespassing as um, someone of another race or a different race than their own. A phenomenon that is possible only in a world of strict and regulated and hysterical racial division and divide. Segregation, in other words. Through the lens of this context, which I'll be returning to in the New Historicism lectures, Irene Redfield's escape to the roof of the Drayton Hotel early in the novel looks quite different than it first appears to us, right, as first-time readers. From the perspective of the novel's free indirect style, which is much like uh, Mrs. Dalloway, even if Mrs. Dalloway bounces, but bounces around and migrates between characters, locked as we are into proximity with Irene Redfield. We are not privy to the potential harassment, embarrassment, or even danger she is putting herself in, should she be found passing or trespassing at the segregated Drayton, in need of reprieve, right, from the heat. It is not until the attractive-looking woman, seated at the table next to her, begins to stare at her, that Irene worries, quote, did that woman, could that woman, somehow know that here before her very eyes on the roof of the Drayton sat a Negro? End quote. But even this question, it's super interesting, is not the first that occurs to Irene. As a woman capable of passing, she carries with her an assumption that the white patrons around her will not even question her presence that they will assume her whiteness, since that is the standard of, of uh, the people enjoying service uh, at the top of the hotel. That they will assume her whiteness rather than suspect um, who or whom she really is. Who she really is, sorry. More than this, we see a shift from one form of consciousness to another. So here I'm thinking about Du Bois. In the first form, Irene plays out the norms and gestures of a class, right? The class comprising the very patrons around her. Okay, I'll be returning to class in the Marxism lectures. She is, in a sense, of them. She and her husband do quite well, um, or rather bougie, as we might say. Um, um, they regular, regularly associate with white and black Americans. Uh, Irene organizes parties, dances, etc., organizes and hosts them. But on these occasions, her race is not in question. She has no reason to hide it, since the um, right the, um, crossing back and forth uh, of the color line in such social occasions like this is sanctioned. But Irene is also, in another sense, at the Drayton, an interloper a space where the color line is more strictly enforced, where the only black presence, potentially, is the waitstaff. When something occurs that eventually brings to mind, right, or brings to her mind, her own out-of-placeness here in this place, another consciousness emerges, a consciousness concerned, as Du Bois puts it, quote, um, with looking at oneself through the eyes of the others, end quote making sure that she is beyond suspicion, measuring up to the tape of a world that is not her own atop this particular hotel. From the get-go, then, the novel can be read as something of a meditation on the arbitrariness and constructedness and incoherence of the naturalized category race, and the racism that afflicts not only individuals, the most obvious example being Claire Kendry's husband, John Bellow, but also the very fabric of the social system itself. Indeed, the woman staring at Irene at the Drayton, who is also a black woman, of course, it's Claire, is not racist, not intending to make Irene feel on edge. Rather, it is the very cultural context itself, developed nicely 
um, in uh, some of the um, later essays and in the introduction to our Norton Critical Addiction, uh, addiction edition, um, it is the context itself, it is the system itself that hails Irene. We'll come back to hailing too in the Marxism lecture. And sustains the regulation and maintenance of, as well as panic concerning the color line. And while race itself is a constructed category um, in Larson's novel, um, on the one hand, on the other, as, as I've just um, tried to demonstrate or suggest, um, regardless of its constructedness, doesn't make it any less real or less effective as a phenomenon, right? And that it actually shapes how, um, how people um, look at the world, how they perceive themselves, and how for many of the characters in this novel, there is this sort of split or the two-ness of consciousness that Du Bois theorizes in his work. Okay. In the next video, I'm going to turn to the novel, to um, one or two passages in the novel itself, and um, try to bring it into conversation with a few passages from Parker's, uh, Parker's textbook as well. Okay? All right.